so welcome everyone to the seventh uh, Northwest Blacksmiths Association um, Knife Makers Corner. Um, knife, we're going to be uh, doing this tonight with Sam Farnsworth, Farnworth, pardon, of uh, uh, Firekeeper Forge. He's down in uh, just outside Bend, Oregon. In I'm sorry, man, I forgot the name of the town again. It's all good, man. I'm in Sun River, Oregon, about 20 minutes south of Bend. There he is. Uh, and he's going to be showing us his techniques for forging a hatchet. Um, Sam does a wide variety of awesome bladed tools. Uh, and this is the one he's decided to share with us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight your video for you, Sam. We also have Dave Lish here, uh, my co-host. He'll be adding commentary, answering questions, and just uh, doing his Dave thing. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight this video, Sam, and let's get this going. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to all the commentary, especially Dave. So it should be awesome. All right, well, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Sweet. All right, so let's get started here. Welcome. My name is Sam. Um, this evening, like it has been mentioned, I'm going to be forging a hatchet. I'm going to be doing a bearded hatchet, and I'll get into specifically what that means in a moment. Um, but I have the forge running. I'll be getting the power hammer turned on shortly. Hopefully that doesn't drown out the audio too bad, but we'll, we'll do our best to make it work. So what I'm going to start with here is the end goal for this hatchet is to have about a one pound head. Now, I do need to account for a little bit of material loss. So I usually go eight to 10 ounces over in the weight. Um, so usually about you know 1.5, little more um, in the initial billet. And this is what I start off with. Now this is 4142 uh, dual steel. And I buy it in big rounds as rolled, so it hasn't had any heat treating or grinding done to it. That's the most effective way to get it. You get it at uh, Pacific Tool Steel over in Portland. So anyway, I cut off a section of the correct weight, and then I forge it rectangular, just like this. Now the dimensions of this are about one inch thick, about one and a half inches tall, and maybe about three inches wide. Um, so it doesn't, necessarily matter. The important part is that the thickness is consistent. And what you also may notice is I have drilled two holes where the eye of the ax is going to be in that is so I can punch this thing as straight as I can without any issues. I find this to be really helpful. These are two quarter inch holes spaced out the correct width to my punch. And that'll make sure that the hole goes nice and straight through this fillet and it doesn't get all wonky. So I'm going to get this in the forge. And then I'm going to go over a little bit more on the anatomy of axes and all that. Mm -hmm. If anyone has any questions during any of this, I, uh, I'll do my best to answer them. So you can see I got the billet in the forge. I'm going to let that I'll probably take five, 10 minutes to heat up. Um, so while that's heating up, I'm just going to go over a few points just in case anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about. This should be able to clear some questions up. Um, in case anybody is not as familiar with axes as I am. So over here, we have an axe head. And there are several parts to an axe head. Um, and I'm going to be mentioning these again throughout the process. So the first thing is the blade or the bit. That's obviously our cutting edge. Um, in this particular design of hatchet, it's a bearded hatchet. So this section right here is called the beard. Uh, moving on back towards the axe, we have the cheeks or lug, which is where the handle fits into. And then the very end is called the pole. And that often is used for hammering. Um, it's usually nicely squared up um, to be used to hit stuff with. And then over here, this would kind of be a top view of the axe. You can see that's the general profile we're going for. And then in the middle, it's going to be what's called the eye. And again, that would be kind of right in this section with the cheeks right around it. And that is where the handle fits in and wedges to. Now, one last thing to mention about the eye is you drive your drift in from both sides. And right here is an exaggerated uh, kind of cross section of what that looks like. So the eye is actually an hourglass shape. And the whole way that these stay on the handles is through wedging. So essentially, you have your handle material that comes up and then you drive a wedge into the top, it spreads it out and it's locked in from both sides. Um, and that's how the handles um, stay connected to the head. So hopefully that clears up all the anatomy of the axes. I'm gonna be drawing on this a couple times throughout the process. 
And I'm going to be using these terms quite a bit. So I hope that hope that helps out. Uh, where did you learn how to forge axes, Sam? Um, so I've basically, my entire bladesmithing career has been self-taught. Um, so same goes for axes, same for the knives. Just went on YouTube and did my best to kind of figure out what people were doing and took a lot of trial and error. And I've only been doing the axes pretty seriously for the past year. And every production run I do, I always take a lot of things away from that and improve them in the future. And uh, it's just been a lot of trial and error for all the learning. Nice. I mean, they're looking yeah. great. So the, the, the uh, process is working. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. So um, while the billet is still heating up, I'm going to just show you guys a little bit of the tools that I'm going to be using that make this process go the way it should. So right here is the punch that I'm going to use to punch out the initial part for the eye. Um, and one quick tip, pro tip from Sam Farnworth for punch um, sizing, you need to have papers going in both direction. Otherwise, the punch is going to get stuck. So you can see it's tapered from the top down. This way, it doesn't need a ton, but you do need a little bit. And it's also tapered in thickness. Now, I learned this the hard way about getting these things stuck in several axes. So if I can help anybody save the heartache of ruining pieces of steel, that's a good tip. Um, I'm also going to be, once the punch gets a little bit further into the material, going to be using a little bit of lubrication, which is just beeswax, oil, and graphite powder. And that will, again, keep this from getting stuck. Um, another thing to mention about all punches and the drift that I'm going to be using, they're all H13 tool steel, which is a hot work steel. Um, you'll find if you're doing this, especially under a power hammer or a press, if you're not using a hot work steel, all your punches and drifts will deform uh, pretty aggressively and they won't work for very long or very well. So that's just one thing to mention. So the first thing I'm going to do is punch out the eye with this. And then I'm going to be moving into a series of different drifts to turn that eye from the rectangular cross section of the punch into kind of more of that um, water droplet sort of teardrop shape, which is eventually this drift is going to be driven through there to get that correct shape. Um, so I'm going to be using these two after I punch the eye, and that will uh, get it to the shape it needs. And then I'm going to be using a variety of different dies under the power hammer and a little bit of hand forging throughout the process, and uh, should go pretty smoothly. So it looks like our axe billet is ready to start forging. So I'm going to turn on the power hammer, and uh, we'll get started. What kind of uh, power hammer are you using tonight, Sam? Uh, so this is a lovely Enyang 88 power hammer. It's awesome. I love it. Uh, you can also do any of these processes, obviously, just by hand or with a hydraulic press. Um, I right now just have the power hammer um, and this power hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the two I'll be using. Um, yeah. And I'll show you all my different die setups to make this go well. But for now, yeah, I know Dave will appreciate that. He's a big fan of the power hammers as well. Oh, yeah. He gets a lot done with <laughs> Sam well, gets a lot done with that hammer he's got. Ah, thanks, Dave. All right, so I have my little container of um, punch lube over here, and I'm just going to be using that periodically. Uh, it's H13 tool steel for all the punches and all the drifts. That's primarily what I use. You can also use S7, but any, they're called hot work tool skills, anything like that'll do. And Sam, that, that H13 is not uh, hardened, it's just as forged, right? Um, the punch, only the end is hardened, and the uh, back end where the hammer will be striking is softened, so I don't damage my dies. For the drifts and stuff, I don't think you necessarily need them hardened. Yeah, that's um, what I didn't, I didn't think so. Okay, cool. So these holes that I drilled in there are the perfect width of the punch. So I'll be able to line this up super well. So I'm going to go in from one side just lightly. And I'm going to do the other side because I really want to make sure this is kept straight. 
because it's a pain in the ass to deal with a crooked eye. So you'll see sometimes the punch will get pretty hot. I'm gonna wait till it's not blowing before cooling it off, just because H13 does not like um, to be quenched. So right now you can see that that punch is lining up pretty perfectly with those holes. So in the next heat, I'm gonna be going down about three quarters of the way. I'm gonna pull the punch out. And then if I come down pretty much all the way on this end, we should end up with a little slug of steel and we should end up with a perfectly rectangular hole. I'm gonna go ahead and cool my tool off because I don't want it to deform. Um, and this is the way I punch you know, in my production runs. They're anywhere from 10 to 16 axes at a time. So this is the method that I've been using the past year. Uh, pretty soon I am gonna be getting a hydraulic press and I'm gonna have a series of different punches and drips through there so I can do this entire process in almost one heat, all the punching and drifting. But um, for now, this, this has been working super well. So what I'm doing right now is this is called a die saddle. And I'm gonna be using this in conjunction with spring dies occasionally, as well as uh, these engine hammers come with dies that you can bolt tooling on. So I'm gonna be using a variety of both of those to have success. But what I am gonna have set up here is after I am done punching the first side and going to the second side, I have this bolster plate here that can be locked into the die saddle, just like that. And now sometimes you don't need this, but sometimes you do. And this will allow the punch to be driven all the way through and push that plug out in case it gets hung up. But we're gonna have that just to the side in case we need. And where did I put my punch? There it is. So I'm gonna get this nicely slathered up with the lubrication. And hopefully this doesn't get stuck. And hopefully I'm not publicly in there. Okay. So that's about three quarters to one side. I will come in and finish it off. There we go, we got the slug. There's the end of the punch. And there we have a pretty centered hole. It's a little bit off, excuse me. It's a little bit off, but I'll be able to fix that a little bit. Well, that punch got pretty hot. Yeah, it's real toasty. And I'm not the gentlest or wisest with my punches, but it works all right. Peter Reich in the audience is, is asking, uh, that hammer looks pretty unique. Is there a story behind it? Yes. Yeah, so if anybody was at my little hammer talk uh, the other night, I was showing off this hammer. It was my favorite hammer. The head is kind of loose. The handle is wrapped, wrapped with masking tape. The face needs to be dressed, but I love this thing because I made it. Nice. And it's uh, <laughs> a little cross peen hammer. It's about around two pounds and I love this thing. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that square hole and I'm gonna be using this starting drift. And as you can tell, the end is rectangular to match that punch, but you can see it slowly, gradually turns into kind of that teardrop shape. So I'm gonna be doing this with uh, um, the hand hammer driving this through and I'm gonna get it to the point where my main drift can slide in there. Once the main drift is in there, then I can start forging out the cheeks of the ax and start separating all the material where it needs to go. So I'm gonna be over here at this wage block and this will allow me to send this drift through and uh, it can go all the way to the ground if it needs to. 
So pretty awesome. And again, these are H13. Um, I actually have something to show you guys because like I mentioned before, I'm all self-taught and I've made a lot of mistakes. This is a 4140 drift, the same steel as the ax. And you can see it got a little deformed. So that's why we don't use this steel for these tools. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna get a slightly bigger hammer. Damn, I, I noticed that, uh, did I wanna ask, did you uh, form your drifts towards any kind of commercial ax head or just did it yourself because you make your own wood handles? Uh, um, so I've kind of taken a lot of my inspiration from this little Swedish hatchet. Okay. So kind of the first axes I started making were little hatchets kind of like this. And you can see my drifts are kind of similar. Um, they're a little bit different. They're a little bit more robust in the back here, but that just kind of seems to be the shape I forge um, when I'm making these things. So, awesome. Because I know you um, pick yeah. your own handles. So you, you make them to fit your drift and that's, that's cool. Yeah, pretty much. And then for this is my smallest drift. So for bigger axes, obviously the drift just gets bigger in all dimensions. Sure. Um, but yeah, those are the drifts I use. So I'm going to be using this slightly bigger four pound hammer, and I'm going to be starting to drive this drift, this, this drift through. I think I'm going to be using one of these smaller holes. And what's great about the swage block is I can fit different tools in each hole so that most, that most of the material can be supported at each time. Um, so it's not getting too funky. So a question. Uh, there's a question about why do I use cross -keen hammers? I use all sorts of hammers. Um, usually the main one is the cross -keen just because it is nice to be able to spread material and then flatten it out with one hammer. Um, I do use a rounding hammer and stuff a lot, but uh, the cross -keen is usually my go-to just because I don't need to switch tools if I need to pull or something out aggressively or anything like that. Okay. It's going. It's also important to get the drift going in the, the correct direction. I definitely made the mistake of not doing that before. Okay. So you can see that hole is getting a little longer. As I drive the drift in further, it's gonna start changing shapes. So I'm just gonna keep driving this in. Um, I'm gonna go mostly from one side and here's why. So when I'm forging out the cheeks um, for, mo for night or like 80% of the cheeks, I'm gonna be having the drift in from the bottom so that material can spread this way and be supported. And I'm only gonna be working from about maybe two thirds of the billet on down. And I really wanna bring that as much material um, down this way as I can. And I don't want a lot up here. So you're gonna see most everything is gonna be drifted and drawn out from the bottom. And I'm gonna be doing a little bit from the top. But most of it's gonna be on the bottom. Um, another reason I do that is a lot of the times when we start forging out the blade, a little bit of material at the front of the eye will get pinched and create a cold shut. You'll see this on a lot of hand forged axes and it's not necessarily a functional issue, um, but I'm in the pursuit of making these things as cleanly forged as I can. So if you just don't drift it all the way at the beginning of the process, you can usually eliminate that. I guess it's not really a problem. Eliminate that feature of a hand forged ax. Let me just a little bit.
So we're looking pretty centered right now, which is awesome. And usually I'll drift if one side better than the other, I'll drift in from that side first because that can sometimes correct the other side. Also, if you do have, even after this kind of starting drift, if you do have an uglier side, I usually put that on the bottom of the ax, A, because it's going to be filled up by the handle, and B, it's easier to adjust uh, in grinding and stuff to make it all straight in line, and nobody is going to really see that portion of it. So is this one of the processes that you are going to try and switch over to the hydraulic press uh, when that arrives? Exactly. So essentially when that press arrives, I don't know where my other tool went. I'm going to have the initial punch set up on one side with different stripper plates so it doesn't get stuck. And then I'm going to have basically two more drifts uh, going to the right and having them set up all with different depth stops so I can adjust them for different size axes. So I can basically punch it do the starting drift and then the final drift in just one heat and hopefully keep everything nice and aligned and straight. So it should be fun to play with. So now I'm gonna be going in from this side and you can see it's turning into that teardrop shape. So basically I'm just gonna drive this starting drift in to the point where I can start getting this in. Um, this one is a little wider and or it's a little thicker and it's a little wider. So this is just to get that initial rectangular hole into that um, teardrop shape to receive this and keep everything nice and straight. Um, if you go straight from the rectangular hole to the teardrop one, it's really easy to get misaligned. So this is a newer development of mine to help keep everything nice and aligned. All right. <laughs> Uh, we have okay. um, Luke, Luke Delmeyer signing in. Uh, he signed in a little late and missed it, but um, he was asking about the, the, the steel for your punches. Uh, the steel for the punches, it's all H13. Usually I do a differential heat treat. Uh, so the striking end is soft and then the working end is hardened. Now you don't necessarily need to harden that at all, but I like the idea of it. I don't know how effective it is, but it, it feels right. So um, as you saw just a second ago, this drift now fits in the hole that I've created. So I'm gonna start driving this down, only working it from one side. And I'm gonna set up some drawing guys on the power hammer and I'm gonna start forging out those uh, cheeks now. All right, so now I'm using this bolt-on tooling. And um, the bolt-on tooling works great because a lot more solid than the spring guys, which I'll be using a little later. Um, it seems to be more accurate. And it's also nice because this is raising up all the way so you can kind of see what you're doing a little better. I used to have these drawing guys um, set up as a spring, um, but it was just really hard to gauge what was going on as well as the spring guys. And I need to learn a lot more about them, but I was using them from anywhere from forging you know, big splitting axes to hatchets. And then I was trying to draw out really thin material and they didn't like that big range of movement. So what I'm doing these bolt-on dies are much more versatile than the springs, even though they are a little slower. Did you drill those dies yourself, Sam? I did. Or no, um, the, the dies on the hammer, they came like that, but I've been making all the um, oh, kind of the cool. bolt-on okay. part of it. Okay. Uh, Jim Garrett is saying uh, he really likes using H21 for drifts on the press. It's a tungsten-based alloy. Uh, it's slippier than H13 and doesn't decarb, 
decarburize and gall the way H13 does on the press, but it tends to chip very dangerously when hand hammered. You see I'm working from this point back. I don't want to collapse this. And you can see those lugs starting to form. So you can see a little bit of that material pinching. So that's why I'm not drifting it out very far right now. I'm just doing it enough so I can get those lugs out. So I'm gonna probably do one more heat from this back side, And then I'm just gonna do a little bit from the top, not very much because I want most of that material down to this side. Okay, so basically the next two or three heats, I'm just gonna keep drawing out those sheets of the ax. And then I'll be uh, moving on to forging the beard transition and then the blade. And then it'll just be a little bit of fine tweaking of the cross section, making everything is the correct thickness. And uh, just doing the final tweaking and we'll have a finished ax here pretty soon. Nice. So I'm bringing this drift in a little further each time and we should keep forging those, those cheeks right out. <laughs> Good. There we go. That's usually the thickness I like. Uh, maybe a little over a sixteenth of an inch right at the edge. Now I'm going to come in from the top and uh, we'll go from that side. Actually, one thing I'm going to do really quick before I do the top because I don't want the top to get deformed is I'm gonna go ahead and set that beard transition now while the top is flat. And then I'll come in from the top with the drift. So usually what I use for that is I just use this piece of round stock, very poorly welded onto this work stick. This has been working just fine. We call that a cheese fuller. <laughs> Not cheese fuller. No, cheese fuller. That's the name of that tool. That's what we call it. The cheese who came up with that? <laughs> I'm not sure who came up with that, but in the Northwest, we know that tool as the cheese fuller. All right. So now I know it as the cheese fuller, and we'll continue on the legacy of the cheese fuller. Is that the Anyang system of die attachment, or is that something you devised, Sam? Uh, this is what comes standard with the Anyang guys, um, the two holes. And I do, they are really good for some things, and then the spring dies are better for other things, but it's nice to have the versatility of both of them. I'm going to use our cheese fuller now. I'm going to go right in front of the eye and start forging this right down. So what that did is that's going to form the separation between the lugs and the beard of the ass. So now I can come in from the top and then spread the lugs out just a little bit from the top, and I'll start forging out the blade. Now, it may not look like we have that much material for the blade, but you'll be impressed with how much it stretches out. Okay, well, I wanna make a correction. If you're using it like that, it's just a fuller. It's only a cheese fuller if you're using it to draw the uh, ax bit. The, the beard, the blade on the okay. side. Okay. Interesting. Just, yeah, I just want to make a correction on huh? Yeah. <laughs> so when I'm drifting in from the top, use a very specific portion of the twig block and you can also use something like this which is a, a bolster plate which will support the axe in all the right ways and give room for those cheeks um, now i don't have one small enough for these hatches this is the one i use for the big splitting axes um, but that's a really good way uh, for consistently keeping everything nice and clean and thick but in this case, I'm going to just be using this rectangular portion of the swage here. 
and resting it um, in a specific way so I'm not damaging uh, the cheek. Oh, here's Jim Garrett. He said, uh, well, he's got a comment about the cheese folder. He said the first time he heard it, and he would be one to know kind of where it came from. It came from Ken White, who was visiting here from England, working with uh, Jack Slack, a um, member who we just lost, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I think Jim just did, re Lynn was asking about the uh, H21. Um, and uh, he just he he said he used to get it at Summer Somerville in Kent. He thinks they still exist, but it might be Uda Home now. I all he also has gotten it at Pacific in Portland. So it sounds like Pacific might have it. That's who you said you got your H thirteen from, right? Uh, yeah, they have H thirteen. They have the forty one forty. They got the forty. Uh, they also I just called them recently because I don't really like forging the round rectangular section. They are, I think, pretty soon here. They're going to be getting some big plates with a 4140 in, and they'll be actually able to cut it into dimensional pieces. So kind of a one by two uh, length part. And it's not super expensive. You'll find, if you look for that size on, online, they catch ridiculously expensive. Um, but they were selling like a one by two inch, by like 12 foot piece, I think around 150 bucks. Uh, better because online that was closer to maybe like 500. So Sam, yeah, that's not bad. Sam, you're making the axe out of uh, 4140. Uh, this particular one is 4142. Okay. Honestly, I'm not sure if there's a lot of difference. I uh -huh. kind of use the two interchangeably just because I use both. Okay. Um, yeah, I never even heard of 4142, so that's really interesting. That's cool. If you are getting it from Pacific, if you get the 4142, that's how you can get it in the as rolled condition with no grinding or heat treating, and that's uh, where it's most cost effective. You just okay. say 4140, it'll come heat treated, ground, and all that. And we'll jump oh, up. yeah. Okay, I'm going to start forging out the blade now or the bit. I'm going to get the length I need first or close. I'm going to get the width. I'm going to hold it like this so I can draw as much material down as I can. Now I'm going to even it up and bring this top edge forward. That in one heat is a rough blade. So now it's going to be a little bit of tuning with the hand hammer to get the correct shape. And then I'm just going to be cleaning everything up during the final drifting and straightening and it'll be done. So after I do a little bit of hand forming to make sure that the shape is how I want it, then I'm going to be going in between just the flat guys to kind of smooth out some of those bigger hammer marks. And then a set of custom made that I made cross section guys, which are exactly the cross section I want for the axe. And that will help kind of fine tune everything, straighten it. And then the very final step will be doing the final drift. Um, and that makes it so the eye is nice and clean. Um, and you don't end up with that cold shut. And we'll get this thing warmed up. Joe's saying, uh, have you tried the uh, Atlantic 33 for drifts? Uh, it's uh, supposed to be pretty good for it. And I guess uh, Brent Bailey um, uses it a lot. Um, I personally have not had the opportunity to try that skill quite yet. I have heard lots of great things about it um, and would love to try it out at some point. Yeah. Oh, Lynn, I'm sorry. Here, I'll, I'll repeat the message again. Um, he said, 
Uh, he really likes using H21. Jim Garrett said, I really like using H21 for drifts on the press. It's a tungsten based alloy. It's slipperier than H13 and doesn't decarburize and gall the way H13 does on the press, but it tends to chip very dangerously when hand hammered. Okay, so essentially what I'm doing is just kind of smoothing out some lumps and bumps. I like a little bit of upsweep to the blade. So I'm just forging that in and I'm just making this kind of beard section a little bit more pronounced. Now you will always, unless you're really talented, you're always gonna end up with a little bit of weirdness in the front. That's okay, because I'm gonna shear that off uh, pretty close to the end. But essentially that's pretty close to the shape. What I'm going to do now is go over to my cross sectioning guys and flat guys and kind of smooth everything out. And we're getting pretty close. So, what I'm going to do once it's up to the correct heat, I'm going to be driving the drift in. And every time I bring this drift in, I'm going in a little bit further each time. Um, so, I'll bring this in from the bottom, I'll go under the flat guys on the hammer, kind of smooth out some of those bigger fuller marks. Do the same thing from the top. That'll also help square the pull up so there's not any big deep gouges in that. And I'll switch over to my cross section guys, get everything nice and smooth and flowing. Then I can go in do the final drifting to make sure everything's nice and smooth. I'll do the same thing from the top. You can see that just kind of smooths out those bigger, bigger hand marks. So this is the time we're having a correctly sized bolster plate. It makes it really easy. What I'll find if I'm just doing it on the suede block, sometimes I'll get a little bit uh, the suede block marking up kind of the surface and just takes a little more grinding. Um, so having one of these bolster plates that's the correct size for what you're doing is pretty helpful. Another thing to note is I want to make sure the drift is going in straight. Sometimes it can get a little bit wonky, which just makes all the handle fitting up a little bit more challenging. So you can see how that drift is tapered because there's space on the bottom. So we're forming that hourglass by going into each side. And you can see there's no weird fold shut or gap in the front. It's tight and drift. Okay. So, so far, we're looking pretty clean. We have our nice cheeks. The pole is pretty nice and, and square. All of this can be tuned up on the grinder if need be. I've been trying to get them as close as I can just as a personal challenge. So right now you can see the cross section is a little bit funky. I'm gonna go in with my cross sectioning guys and that'll smooth this all right up. And then we'll do a little bit more hand tweaking to the final drifting. And they're looking pretty good so far. There we go. So these are my cross sectioning guys. I have them on the spring set up because they don't need to be super, super accurate. So there's a little bit of play. That's okay. I like it because it's quick. So if you want to come over to this side, you can see exactly what shapes are going to form. So that's going to form a really nice smooth transition from the eye into the blade of the axe. And all my power hammer dies are 4140. Um, 
I haven't had the need to make them out of H13 yet. I don't even, I haven't even heat-treated these. They were kind of more of like a test of concept. And in the event that they do start getting mucked up, I'll go ahead and heat-treat them. And as long as they're not getting too hot, 4140 should be fine. The other steel that works great for that as forged tooling like that is 4340. I find it to be a bit tougher than 4140. Really nice cross section. It's flowing nicely into the blade. For edge thickness, it obviously depends on what kind of axe you're making, but for an axe like this, about 3 16 before grinding is usually pretty good. And if things are a little bit out of alignment, that's enough material for you to grind it straight. The one thing you may notice is that there is a shoulder between where I was using those dies and the cheek. So as I'm going through the final drifting portion, I'm going to be, once I get the drift in there, I'm going to be coming in here and forging that down so it's a nice smooth transition into the blade for the bit. And I'm just going to be keeping those guys on there in case uh, things need a little bit, bit of adjustment. I can just jump on the hammer and make any adjustments that I need. I'm just going to be sending. First, I'm going to drop the drill. Then I'm going to start sending it through. And I'm going to come over here and get rid of that shoulder. And I'm only going to be working on the half that the drift is coming from because I don't want to deform the top. You can see that smooth that transition right up. Just uh, some hammer acrobatics really quick for you guys. Now I'm going to come in from the top, just do the same thing. I'm going to take one or two more heats to finish driving that drift down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, from the bottom, be driving this drift down pretty much to where the transition between the striking end and the drift goes. And then from the top, I want it to be a little bit smaller. So I might go maybe half of an inch up to the drift. That way I don't have to wedge out quite as much material, but I still get a lot at the bottom to be a nice strong handle because if the handle's gonna break anywhere, it's usually between where the head transitions into the handle. I wanna keep that nice and thick and nice and strong. So you don't obviously have to do this. You can do it the same from both sides, but this is just how I like to do it. There we go. That's a really lovely transition from the eye into the blade. So now the next heats, I'm just going to keep driving the drift all the way through. If there are any weird hammer marks, I can get rid of them now. So for the heat treating, um, what I've kind of been developing over the past little bit is uh, I quench the entire head. Um, I usually heat treat them out of my forge, and I don't heat the poles quite as much as the edge. So they don't, in theory, obviously I don't, um, I can't at this point in my career, Rockwell test everything to prove this theory, um, but I don't get the pole quite as hot. So in theory, it doesn't get quite as hard. Um, and then I quench the whole ax. I usually use part 50 oil uh, for this particular alloy. It seems to work just fine, seems to get plenty hard. And then what I'll usually do is after the quench, I'll temper them around 400 degrees um, and then what I'll do is I'll go in with an oxytocin torch at the end and I'll temper back the cheek just to give those a little bit more um, ductility and a little bit of softness in case somebody decides to really beat the heck out of one of these things, uh, the cheeks won't split anything. I tend to be very, I tend to think people are going to do some pretty gnarly things to my stuff, which is usually not the case, but I like to build them. Um, in the event somebody decides to 
using this as a splitting wedge and blast it in with a sledgehammer. I really love it to survive that. This is where having that bolster plate would be good because you can see the top getting a little bit torn. But it's not too bad. Just making sure the pole is nice and squared. It is nice to even have a paper back just a little bit just visually. So this drift needs to go in just a little bit further from the bottom. I'll do it from the top. Make sure the blade's in line and we'll be done. Here we go. That's pretty close. So when we're looking at this, I want the material to be really tight along the grip. No gap. It's looking pretty good. When I'm hammering this, I'm just making sure everything's nice and smooth. There's no lumps and bumps. And I run a really nice clean forge. I'm going to come in from the top, do the same thing, and that'll start getting us the correctly shaped eye. Uh, Luke Delmeyer is asking uh, any axe heads with permanent drift handles? Um, <laughs> only punch handles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said he's got a couple that aren't coming out. It's sword in the stone style. Yeah, it can get real shiny. So I'm going to go in once more through the bottom, make that a little bit wider. But so far, the eye is looking super clean. It is Everything looking really nice good, Sam. Thick thickness. Thank you. Yeah. Things need to be a little bit straightened, but that'll be super easy to fix. Okay, so our eye is at the final dimension, a little bit bigger at the bottom. We have that lovely hourglass shape. So when it gets all wedged in, it should be nice and secure. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do now is switch over. I'm gonna go over to the cross section guys one more time just to clean everything up. I'm gonna then shear the front of the edge. And then I'm gonna show you guys my tips for doing all the straightening. So at this point, we don't really need to move the material that much. We're just kind of working it nice and slowly, smoothing it out. So I don't need to get it super, super hot. I don't need to go crazy into the power hand. It's just kind of smoothing and planishing out, um, just to make it look nicer. Um, some people dig kind of the more rustic tools and axes with really big tool marks in there. But um, using that Swedish axe is kind of my inspiration, maybe. 
That axe, the only grinding on it is the sharpening. And that's the end goal to just get a, a clean enough forging so I just have to sharpen it. We're not quite there yet, but I'll get there eventually. I can also, if I see if things are not in alignment, I can tilt this different ways and it will kind of straighten it out initially. That's looking very really good. So when I look to straighten these things, I'm looking right down the edge of the ax. And you can see right at the bottom here, it's a little bit kick this way. So when I do get to the straightening after I shear the edge, I'm gonna have to push some of that material around to get everything nice and aligned with the eye. If everything's aligned with the eye, it should align with the handle. And it should have a nice straight axe. So to get the front edge nice and clean, I'm gonna be using this mild steel plate to protect the dies and this H13 hot cut. I'll just come right on there and just shear off all that funkiness on the edge. Should be nice and clean. Then I'll be able to really gauge where the straightening needs to happen and if any other adjustments need to happen. And we'll be done. Nice. And is this, are you shearing uh, your production axes as well? I am, yeah. Nice. It doesn't take much just to get a little bit of that big off there to save time. Didn't take much. Sometimes get a little more, but that should be just fine. And that'll be really easy to clean up with the grinder and put a slight curve on it. And it'll be the grinding on this will take just a couple minutes. So again, I'm just gonna start checking it for straightness. I'm gonna do the first round of straightening just by eye like this. And I'm gonna go in with this special drift that I made and that'll help really dial in the straightening. All right, so shut this guy off. I can show you all the drift I use for straightening. Now, this is what I use for straightening and I straighten everything from the hatchet all the way up to, you know, the big four or five pound splitting axis. Okay? And the reason why I like it so long as compared to my other drifts is it allows me to sight down the entire length of the drift and kind of simulate how the handle would be um, because things can look a little bit off on the head, but still be straight. And the important part is that everything is in line with the handle because that's what makes this kind of effortless to use because you know exactly where the edge is going to be and not kind of twisted in a weird direction that you kind of have to compensate for. So this is the drift I use. I'll go in however far it needs to go. I don't drive it in. I just slip it in there and then I can sight down from both sides and make sure everything is exactly where it should be. First, I'll just do it by eye. That looks pretty close. I just slide this on there just like that. And I can look right down and see what needs to happen. And you can see we're a little bit off on the bottom. So I'll just tap that over. Make sure everything is how it should be. And it is nice to get it close, but if it's a little bit off because it's really fighting you, then you can just go under the grinder and it's super easy to, easy to fix. But so I'll make sure to go in from the bottom and the top because sometimes it's a little different from side to side. And if it is, I just find a middle ground between the two. And it's looking Pretty close. It's also important to look 90 degrees towards the drift because if your angles are off, you'll get, get a different appearance to it. Oh, it is. Have you around a bit more often to make for quality control. 
All right, so we're really close, just a few fine little tweaking points. And then I will go ahead right after forging these things, I'll give them two kind of uh, normalizing cycles you know, around the 1500 degree mark. Um, I don't think 4140 is as critical as some of kind of the higher carbon, higher alloy steel. Um, but I'll also do kind of three right before I do the hardening process, just to make sure that the grain is as fine as I can get it. So it'll be a nice tool that won't chip out. It'll be pretty easy to sharpen and they'll be nice and they'll be nice and be able to take an impact. So um, I usually, I don't know if you can normalize something too many times apart from losing carbon and decarburizing the steel, but it seems, seems like a good idea to at least do it a couple of times. Dave Lish would know the answer to that question, I'm sure. Well, I was going to say that there is a point where uh, it seems like three thermal cycles is the magic number. And after three, you're really not doing yourself any favors. Got it. Uh, it comes to a point where it's not getting any fine. I actually quench on the third normalizing cycle. Got it. Great piece of knowledge to know. Can you over normalize, Dave? Like, I mean, besides the decarb that Sam was talking about, are there I any other? Heard, I have heard that you can make the grain so fine that then it's kind of working against you. Yeah. Oh. You. I'm not a metallurgist. I never claim to be. I just know enough to get by and from my, my experimenting and testing. Okay, so I think that's looking pretty good. So go ahead, stick it in the forge. I'll turn my forge down a little bit, give it two normalizing cycles and I'll kind of just brush it off with this uh, between cycles. I don't get crazy with the brushing because I'm trying to forge these out in a pretty efficient manner. So I just get the metal moved to where I need it and I'll clean it up with a wire wheel or whatever at the end. But for these normalizing cycles, a little wire brush does help clean everything up a bit. Uh, Peter Peter Rice is asking um, about uh, when you he's saying are you glad you went with a power hammer first and then uh, got the press or do you if you could do it again would you have gotten the press first? Oh, I actually used to have a press. I used to have one of those coal ironwork ones, and it was one of their older ones. And I can't speak to their newer ones, but I wasn't super into it. And that's what I used primarily for. Um, knife making and a press for knife making is definitely not as good as a power hammer in my opinion especially when you get down to thinner cross sections of steel the press size really just kind of suck all the heat out um, so if I had one I would choose a power hammer whether that be a self-contained air hammer or just like a tire hammer or like a little giant for knife making specifically I would say versatility um, a power hammer would be a little better um, but the combination of a press and a power hammer is pretty much the perfect combo um, in my experience the dream from what team. I see in other people's shops. But definitely I would choose a power hammer over a press if I just had one. Yeah, yeah people, are lo people love the demo, Sam. Uh, Bryson said, thanks everyone. Uh, Patricia said, great demo. Thank you, Lynn Moore. That was a really great demo, well organized. Tim Reagan, that was great. Thanks, NWA. Thanks, Sam from Luke Delmeyer. That was, it was wonderful. People had a really good time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad you guys enjoyed it. And I'll just run this through a couple of cycles later on this evening. And I'll post up a picture to my Instagram when it's all finished and tag the NWBA so you guys can see what it looks like all done. And right thank you all for showing up. And I really appreciate all the support. Yeah. We're going to, if you guys are interested, we could do um, a little shop tour if you guys just, if there's anybody left. Um, yeah. So there's my forge set up. It's right outside right now. Eventually, when the price of lumber gets a little more reasonable, I am gonna be building kind of an awning to the front and side of the shop, um, just because right now it is rather small, but because it's getting hot here during the day, I have that outside um, so it doesn't get too hot. That is my lovely camera woman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, it was great. Yeah, and then in here is the rest of the shop. Now this actually used to be a 12 by 24 carport. And it was here um, when we moved into this house and I got permission to kind of outfit it and bring electricity in here to make it my shop. So 
this DL frame was basically in the roof was just here. And I've just been kind of working it into the shop. So kind of out in the front, we got all my metal work and heat treating here and all my forging area. And then I have the power hammer just on a concrete slab right now because the rest of the floor is, floor is gravel. Um, so yeah, just, you know, all the, the metal work and hot work stuff. And then I got my little welding set up here. Back there, I have my little contained grinding room. So that kind of helps keep the dust down in here. That's a good move. And then back, yeah, it's helpful for the lung health for sure. And then back here is kind of my finish work area and I'm a little leather work zone and a little milling machine. And these are all the blades I've been working on today. Just getting oh, nice. all prepped for their handles. So I'm gonna be finishing those, these up in the next week in preparation for a big drop. Um, so all those are going to be available in the next couple of weeks here. Nice. Yeah. That was a wonderful demo, Sam. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. And uh, we'd love to maybe do more in the future if people want to see different axes or different Oh, we'd stuff. love to have um, you back for the knife maker stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll uh, keep in touch and see if we can make it happen. Right on. We, we definitely will. Thank you so much, Sam. All right, everybody. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Everybody have a great night. We'll, we'll see you at the next one. Awesome. Thank you guys so much and see you later. All right, folks. Bye now. Bye.